Welcome to TraumaCast. It's like a podcast, but about trauma. Listen and learn from our team about current trends, new research, and continuing performance improvement efforts. This education is available for CNEs. Successful completion includes watching or listening to the entire session and completion of the attestation and evaluation. The link for the attestation and evaluation is located at the end of this video. We hope you enjoy and please let us know what you think. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another TomaCast. We are joined by a special guest today, Robert Crowder. He is one of our PAs from our neurosurgery team. And today we'll be talking about um, brain injuries in with our trauma patients. Um, and so just to introduce ourselves, Bob, did you want to go ahead and give us a little blurb on who you are and what you do? Oh, I want to keep that information as minimal as possible. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, I've been a PA here with the nurse surgery team for uh, 14 plus years now, and um, it's been a great experience, and uh, it's always stuff to learn, it's always exciting, and uh, it's great to work alongside the trauma folks uh, when called upon to do so. Um, yeah, um, not sure what else you want to know, we got to just keep it to a minimum. <laughs> Thank but you for joining very, us. He's being very humble. <laughs> Bob is one of the neurosurgery PAs who's definitely a go-to when we have questions here on the trauma side. Um, I can't tell you how many things I have pushed his way to say, hey, Bob, help me understand or <laughs> um, what should we have done? So uh, definitely a resource that people should know about. Yes. And just to introduce our tr lovely trauma team as well, we have Liz Weibel, our NP, and Jen Fritzstein, our program manager, and myself, Juliana Kim, for uh, part of the Injury Prevention Outreach and Education. Um, so again, today we're going to be talking about tra uh, traumatic brain injuries. Um, it's the summer. We see a lot of kids with uh, coming in with a lot of um, head strikes and um, falls and MVCs, all that such. And we really wanted to highlight this so that we can be on the same page on kind of what our protocol is and what our practices are and just kind of pick the brains of our nurse of, of Bob of, from the neurosurgery team on what they want what they're looking out for and how they're treating our patients um and Jen would you be able to kind of give us an overview of the typical type of um head injuries we see in the trauma bay coming in you know the word typical I guess it, it it's a hard one because yeah. Kids come in with multiple types of mechanisms that they bang their heads for anywhere from just a head bump with the goose egg and a little maybe concussive syndrome, all the way to our severe head injured patients. And there's no one mechanism, I think, that you can really point to, you know, kids who are in car crashes, a lot of those kids are coming in with maybe polytrauma and concussion may just be one of the things within the subset of injuries that they have all the way to a TBI, which may be their main problem with then a lot of other uh, concurrent injuries that maybe aren't as severe, you know, uh, kids who are hit by cars. Um, we get a good number of patients coming through the code room that we're not quite sure how they got injured, but they do have a head injury. And, you know, those are the kids that we're working up sometimes for our non-accidental traumas. Um, kids are falling down steps um, this time of year, you know, they're outside playing and climbing and, you know, getting the gamut from a minor head injury to a severe head injury, just from, you know, different, different kid activities that you're doing while you're playing outside. So, you know, I think typical kind of goes along the spectrum of if a kid can find a way to hurt themselves or uh, fall or do anything, they're going to find it in that head because they have such a big head is always an area of concern. Yeah, and um, Liz, would you be able to kind of talk to us about like just a very, very short uh, blip of like how, why kids are more prone for, for head injuries and like how their anatomy kind of lends to that? <laughs> yeah, I think Jen, Jen just alluded to it, but yeah, so they have, I mean, their, their heads uh, relative to the rest of their body are much are much bigger. Um, so, and again, you know, a lot of them are just, you know, developmentally or learning how to walk, et cetera. And um, again, we see lots of 
um, stair injuries and things like that. And then of course, um, you know, with your older kids, um, plus minus, you know, bike helmets, obviously that's going to be a big consideration of, you know, overall protection, um, uh, you know, if they, if they are injured. So, uh, so, not, so specifically, so, so we do see a lot of kids that fall. And again, with them um, having larger uh, head circumference, you know, relative to body size, um, oftentimes uh, head injury is right there as one of those uh, diagnoses. Yeah, and Jen, were you going to say something? At or, uh, so, you know, Liz mentioned helmets, uh, seatbelts, car seats, it properly installed, uh, using the right way. All of that really weighs into those kids we see. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, also from a developmental standpoint, just the impulsivity. Not only, you know, do they not do cause and effect, but just the impulsive, even kids who know better, you know, dart across the street to get the ball. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's like, there's no actual sports thought, injuries. Yeah. I mean, sports injuries in the older kids too. You know, yeah. even if you do have a helmet, that just still doesn't, you know, uh, eliminate the possibility of injury. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's yeah. also um, the unforeseen situations, but uh, aside from car accidents, but I mean, uh, objects falling on you. You got kids climbing, and next thing you know, mm -hmm. the dresser is falling over on top of you. Uh, something falls, like a big tree branch, cracks a kid in the head, you know, you just, you don't know. Sometimes those injuries, certainly uh, you can't account for those, but others, children, again, don't know the cause and effect, don't know they shouldn't be climbing on a, on the top of a ladder without some sort of uh, supervision, you know, or shouldn't be riding the bike without their helmets on, so. We've even seen dog bites. Yeah, I, I was yeah, gonna mention that, we do dog bites, mm -hmm. very, very, yeah, we, we get, uh, at least uh, probably a handful of those a year. Mm -hmm. A couple of them are penetrating injuries. So we've got CSF egress and we have to take them to the OR and get them cleaned out. Yeah, very dirty wounds. Um, and kind of going along the veins, like when we do accept these patients or we find these patients in the ER, um, do you, what are the type like, general um, differences between the type, different types of injuries, such as like mild to moderate and to severe TBIs? Like, are what are we about, like? Like triage? Yeah, kind of like, how do we kind of triage them between? Because moderate to severe is what are the, the patients we will see generally in the, um, in the trauma bays, but like certain like- so there's different triage criteria that will help us determine who can be seen in the main ED and who needs to go to the code room and at what level. You know, I think the easiest one, if you have a GCS less than eight, if you are not, you know, mentating well, that's an automatic code room. Um, whether it is, if it's less than eight, we think you're less than eight, you're not responding well, that would be a trauma stat attending. Um, that nine to 14 would be a trauma stat. Now, if the GCS doesn't get you, we do have some mechanisms built into our trauma activation, like Bob mentioned, the dresser falling on a kid or a piece of large furniture. Uh, several years ago, because we had that happening so many times, we actually put that in our trauma activation criteria. Mm -hmm. um, kids getting hit by a car greater than 20 miles per hour. Um, we definitely have criteria for car crashes at different speeds with or without um, seatbelts or car seats. So um, if you look at your trauma activation criteria, there's a lot built in around mentation and around mechanism of injury that would be energy transfer that would make us concerned for a head injury. The open skull fractures on that list as well for trauma set attending activation. Yeah, if you see the skull, no way now. <laughs> Now, I guess uh, the question I'll ask Bob, though, is, you know, there, we have all this, this is when you come to the code room. From a neurosurgery standpoint, when do you guys want us to call you to be down there? Um, well, we always like to see the imaging first. It doesn't help us determine whether we need to be, uh, you know, immediately involved or not without seeing the imaging. But certainly, uh, if you have a child coming in with the severe um, uh, traumatic brain injury, again, eight or less on the GCS, then, you know, we, we should be involved because we want to be there when this, that scan is, is done so we can make some recommendations based upon that. Uh, we might find a, a big hematoma that needs to be evacuated, or you may not find anything, in which case we think maybe this is probably just a shear injury, acceleration, deceleration kind of thing, and uh, then we wouldn't be involved at all. But 
uh, we'd rather be there sooner rather than later. Um, a kid that's maintaining well and talking and screaming and crying neurologically intact as far as that's concerned, then uh, it's not like we need to be there right then and there. You, you could, uh, you could Can you wait talk for a minute on, you made a question, you made a statement about like you need, you want to see imaging. That's kind of your, your, your first line. Um, yet I know with these really severe injured uh, TBIs, we're calling neurosurgery a lot to have before they arrive. And we're saying, hey, Bob, I got a kid coming in who's unresponsive, get down there. And you guys are fabulous about getting down there. I can't see one instance and in when, when you guys were called, you weren't there either before the child arrived or within five minutes. However, can you talk to the people listening about why the C head CT is of such importance versus that physical exam? Um. Well, honestly, I'll, I'll start with the physical exam. Though. I'm going to go back to that. I mean, if, if the child is is not mentating, they're unconscious. You've got a blown pupil. You're probably going to find something on the scan that's going to say, "Hey, we're we're going to go do something with this child," um, because a shear injury isn't going to cause you to have a blown pupil for the most part. You're probably going to have some sort of herniation um, situation going on from a blood clot. Um, so. Uh, we could go on the physical exam there, but going back to the imaging, uh, your question was what we, what we find on that would that would make us. Why is that? Why is that so important that you know? The, your first question is, do we have a head CT? Yeah. Why are you asking me that so early? Um. Well, it it we can we can most just from experience we know the severity uh, and the uh, the degree of uh, maybe uh, the hemorrhage tells us, oh, this is something we can probably, we don't, we, should, we shouldn't see a huge um, impact on the neurologic function from this. Uh, this is not gonna be a surgical, uh, it's not gonna be need, not gonna need neurosurgical intervention, but rather it's gonna need following, you know, over the course of time. Uh, just because you have, we, it happens all the time. We get called with a trauma transfer that, oh, the kid's got a fracture and a subdural hematoma, but we can't see the films. So, okay, we're made aware of it, but wait until you see the films. And, oh, it might be two millimeters of an epidural hematoma, which doesn't require intervention, just maybe, and may not even require repeat imaging if the kid's mentating well. But, you know, the the, um, the story doesn't come down the line with all the details. And if you can't see the imaging, it's, you don't, uh, you know, you're not going to go evacuate a two millimeter epidural or subdural hematoma. Um, that's why we want to get the imaging because the, the story isn't always clear. And it kind of drives your your plan of care then. Oh, it does for yes. sure. For yes. sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you, you put it all together. You could find a child with a sizable epidural, but they're mentating well. So, you know, it's a risk versus benefit, you know, it, it, just because the child has a hematoma and it's three centimeters they're mentating well. Do you need to take them emergently, or do you think you can watch them? Is the child doing well enough? Uh, it's it's a lot of times it's a game time decision. I have another question. That most of the questions I ask, I usually know the answer. I'm just kind of being the devil's advocate. I'm going to ask you a question I don't know the answer to. And I may not know it either. <laughs> I bet you do. When we're talking about epidurals and subdurals, and you talk about you know two millimeters, three millimeters. I have never really known what do you guys consider what's what's big, small, and surgical. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, you have to also consider which hematoma it is. Uh, you know, an epidural hematoma. It you know it <clears throat> doesn't cross the suture lines, right? So it's going to build up fast. You can decline really quick. You can deteriorate really quickly from that. Um, so, you know, a small one, two millimeters associated with non-displaced linear fracture, uh, that's nothing. You got one that's maybe a centimeter, you've got to be concerned about probably evacuating that or checking the kid's mental status frequently. And then if they decline, then you've got to go evacuate that. Uh, a subdural, there's more space for that collection of blood to spread over the hemisphere. So you could probably have uh, a, you know, maybe up to a centimeter of a subdural um, hematoma in place and the patient's not being dramatically impacted. There's obviously a shift there, but they're 
they're, you know, they're mentally with it. So, you know, again, that's someone that might be able to be watched. And, and if they're mentally with it, you may not need to evacuate them right away. Um, especially in, in um, older adults, which we don't see here, but uh, they usually have a lot of room because uh, of atrophy of the brain as we get older. I think that's what's going on with mine right now. Um, oh, me too. But, but seriously, uh, I, I think if you look at a centimeter or more, you're probably going to be looking at evacuating a subdural and, a, and an epidural. If they're mentating well, you might be able to watch it, but uh, more than likely uh, an acute uh, epidural is probably going to require uh, some intervention. There are times when we've waited on epidurals. The children are mentating well, but their symptoms drive us. Their headaches are just too bad. Mm -hmm. So so then we take them to the OR. Yeah. When your team uh, re requests us nursing to do uh, to watch their neurologic status, to do neuro checks, what exactly what exactly are you guys looking for? Are you guys looking for the nurse to document a GCS? Are you looking for a pupil exam? Are you all the above plus? Yeah, well, you're you're hitting the nail on the head. Certainly, uh, you want to know their mentation level. Are they able to talk to you? Are they oriented? Uh, are they starting to lose their orientation uh, because the their brain's just becoming too encephalopathic for one reason or another? Probably the hematoma, and uh, maybe there's been something going on with uh, oxygenation somehow. Um, but you're you're going to be looking at their ability to follow commands, uh, their strength. Have they got a new weakness now? Has the hematoma they had in their head? It was small at first as it progressed, and now you've got compression on the motor strip and you had a weakness. Um, then, of course, pupils. Um, you're going to see uh, that's that's the big one there that we're really concerned about because that's probably a herniation. We got pressure on the brainstem there. But um, those other things can certainly point to a problem that needs intervention sooner um, that you might actually see before you see a pupillary problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's actually really helpful. And I know it's something we've been working with as far as to make sure we were, we're trying to do better on that whole documentation of those Q1 neuro checks that you guys are asking for. Um, it's hard to do in the emergency department. Um, yeah. Um, you know, easier when they get to it, the ICU. Yeah. yeah. If, if, if it's a Q1 hour neuro check, uh -huh. in the ICU, they, they shouldn't be hanging out in the trauma bay that long. They should already be in the ICU. You're right. And uh, yeah, should have had a couple of assessments within the hour. Easy. Not waiting on one hour. So it, exactly. Exactly. Get your imaging done and have your lines set up and already made your decision whether you're going or not. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, in a perfect world, we would have an ICU bed ready for everybody who needed a Q1 neuro check. But that doesn't always work. Out. Yeah. <laughs> I get kind of going along the lines because these are like, especially during the high census times when we can't get our patients up to the PICU and they do have to have um, boarding down in the ER. And we do have those kids that are kind of on the cusp or like right on that border, like, hey, we need to watch them for the next 24 hours and then maybe do a repeat imaging. When, um, and, you, and they do the Q1 hour nerve trust, they do the GCS and their mentation, if they are there like questioning the A's and O's and all that stuff. Um, when is it, um, is it with any changes that they should be notifying neurosurgery or what is the most concerning for you guys that you guys want to be notified for? Uh, good question. Uh, as I was mentioning there, you, you've got a, a change in their uh, motor function. That's, mm -hmm. we've got to be concerned about that. Maybe they've got new onset seizures all of a sudden, which, mm -hmm. What you might find just obviously with a subdural hematoma and they've already been put on anti-epileptics, but uh, it's, is it is it worsening? Um, or if you didn't have seizures to begin with, maybe a child presented with uh, some contusions, which the edema can spread, the contusion can get larger itself. And then, then now we have new onset seizures. So that may prompt us to get some new imaging uh, mm -hmm. based upon when they first came in. Um, and... Uh, Again, motor functions we talked about and pupillary changes, uh, and just the um, and just a change in their mentation, their level of uh, awareness and alertness. Um, those are the things we need to know about. Awesome. And then, like after like initial injury, like on those kids that are like kind of on that cusp, they're like GCS of nine, ten, and they're they have um, some like a small bleed, and you guys are watching them for the Q1 neuro checks. Um, when is like, what time frame is it the most um, critical that you guys want to, that you guys see that, 
things yeah. can change. Good, good <laughs> question. Can well, change. you know, you, you think about the most critical time frame after presenting with a TBI, it's usually like the first 24 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so you a child that comes in that's probably a GCS of nine to 13, that's the moderate degree of, of uh, traumatic brain injury, right? Uh, by GCS standards anyway. Um, you're not going to let them go after just 24 hours of observation. You're probably going to watch them an extra day. They've probably been pretty heavily concussed and most likely have some headache and vomiting that, uh, that you need to monitor for a while longer. Um, but uh, I, I usually, if you have a small bleed, um, you know, and the kid's mentating well, we're going to let the neuro exam dictate whether we be, re, whether we repeat imaging or not and, and, and move on to intervention. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, on the child that is more towards the 9, 10 range, and they're, they're just a little foggy, uh, yeah, we're going to, uh, we're probably going to end up with some repeat imaging. I can imagine the injury that's put that child in that situation probably warrants repeat imaging anyway. Uh, and it's not going to be a, oh, maybe we won't. It's probably going to, it's going to warrant a repeat imaging, usually within six to eight hours, the initial image. Uh, and then... Uh, we can follow the exam and, and check on that repeat image and go from there. Uh, but I like that the moderate, I don't know if there's any particular standard that's set out there that says, okay, this time frame is critical. But I think what you look at is use your clinical judgment on the presentation of the patient and initial image and say, maybe uh, repeat imaging within six to eight hours. Um, but then you look at your overall outcome kind of thing, and you need to be on the lookout for uh, a downturn in events um, or, or a downturn in patient situation over the 24 to 40 hours following the injury. So that really goes back to the importance of the nurses really doing those Q1 neuro checks and really keeping a close eye on these kids for 24, 48 hours post injury. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you could adjust your um, surveillance of the patients, you know, based upon how well they're progressing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What else do you want to know about? Do you, you, I would imagine you'd want to know about, you know, worsening headaches or you know, any other physical symptoms. No, yeah, that certainly. Yeah, it, 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 if their vomiting is getting worse yeah. um, and, and if their headache is just unrelenting, it's, it's gotten worse, like you said, um, those, those, those are very good points to bring up and be on the lookout for. Um, so mentation, motor function, uh, new symptoms, um, for sure, we, we need to know about or worsening of existing symptoms. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then kind of changing gears to our severe patients, like severe TBIs, those are, these are the kids that come into the image, uh, to the trauma bay. We know they're coming. They, we know that they have altered mental status. Um, and uh, these are probably the kids that we are calling and we're like, hey, we have this kid coming in. They're altered. Their mechanism of injury was that they, they they fell off an ATV going at 50 miles per hour without a helmet. They have positive LOC and their GCS is like a seven, right? So we know that we're probably going to get intubated and um, get right to uh, CT for imaging. Does neurosurgery have a benchmark on how quickly these kids need to go to CT and get imaging so that they that you guys can make those um, decision for OR or not? Um, yeah, I, I, yeah so I, within the hour, it should be stabbed. As soon as you determine they've got some stability with the airway, and that's going to be your first uh, priority when the kid rolls in uh, is the airway. Uh, maybe that's already been established, you know, uh, in the field. But uh, as soon as you get the kid in and get your primary survey done, you need to get that CT scan. And, and it should be ideally within the hour of them rolling through the door. Yeah, you know, we've spent some time looking at, well, not some time, all the time. <laughs> We look at all of these severe head injuries, and one of the metrics we look at is how efficient are we in the code room and how quickly are we getting these kids to the CT scanner? And we look at different different things that have slowed us up. You know, IV access in a young patient can really slow you up, and now our teams are doing a lot better use going to IO pretty quick. We Then we also looked at, you know, what are the important things that need to happen to a kid with head injury? You know, oxygenation, ventilation, circulation, important of maintaining a blood pressure. And based on the fact that, you know, airway breathing and circulation are our main have-tos in that code room, and then CT kind of follows right after that, 
Um, one of the things that we have seen hold us up in the room is the administration of 3% saline or mannitol. So if I have a kid that really does have a GCS of three or four, you know, pupils sluggish, maybe, you know, on the larger side, and I'm not necessarily going to say fixed and dilated at this point, but where does where does three percent saline or hyperosmolar therapy fit in with weighing that with getting to CT? Um, that's a that's a good question. It's a tough uh, question. We struggled with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I don't. Yeah, tough Sorry, one, Bob. <laughs> I, I, I like I, you know. You're good if you if on the presentation, I don't think you have to give the three percent. It's going to be helpful, you know, especially if you've got a kid who comes in the GCS is eight or less. You're, you're probably you're expecting you're going to find something on the exam that's going to warrant the administration of the three percent. Um, but uh, it getting the CT is also going to help determine whether you're going to go to the OR or not. So I I think. Getting that done, if you're having a problem with IV access, uh, you can get the scan faster, maybe have someone working on the IV at the same time they're trying to get the kid into the scanner kind of thing, you know, kill two birds with one stone um, kind of thing. I, I, I think that there's nothing that says that kid has to be slammed with 3% right off the bat. Mm -hmm. the, the scan's probably not going to show edema right away. Uh, it may show up later on. You're going to anticipate probably with with a, with an injury that's caused a GCS of eight or less that they're probably going to have swelling and yeah you can administer three percent but I don't think there's anything any standards that says you're going to slam that patient with three percent as soon as they roll through the door or any hyperosmolar agent. Yeah, it's you know, not going to make them come around. Yeah, well, that's discussion we've had that you know the the three percent settling the mannitol that's really effective when you have a kid that has swelling and they haven't had time yet. And that's where that's why we kind of look at that as a delay and have spent some energy on saying, yeah. no, if, if this is not something that can be quick and concurrent with something else, mm -hmm. let's get them to the scanner. So yeah, just think think about, uh, you know, any trauma to the body, whether it's brain or just simple twist yeah. your ankle kind of thing. It doesn't swell right away. Mm -hmm. It's a process. Right. There's a little cascade of things that are going on. So I don't know that that swelling is going to be right then and there. It's it's going to happen, uh, and we we can treat that accordingly. And if there's a mm -hmm. blood clot, we'll get that out, and then you can get your three percent going on and monitor your ICPs and use that as as needed, uh, or even mannitol as an adjunct. But I think three percent is your is your go to right now. Yeah, thank you. I, you just brought up something else that lends, I think, to another topic that I like to talk about is the insertion of intracranial pressure monitoring, and. Um, Sometimes you guys can't put it in, I think, as quickly as you'd like to because of coagulopathy. Can you talk about what you guys are looking for as far as labs or what you guys need to happen in order to be able to put an ICP in? Uh, we like a one point INR of 1.5 or less. Okay. Yeah, that's That keeps us, uh, lowers our risk of having, you know, more hemorrhage issues <laughs> Uh, as, as we work on the head, right? We, we don't want to make it worse. Yeah. So in the emergency department, when we're in the trauma bay and we're sending labs, that PTPTT is a really critical lab for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and now that we have plasma in the emergency department, that also would be a nice adjunct to help you guys mm. out. Um, for sure. Early on. Now, when you put an ICP monitor in um, and you look at opening pressures, Where where is your okay? This is okay versus we need to do something now. Is that how is that changing your plan of care? Um, well, we we like ICPs to be uh, uh, twenty or less for the most part, and we'll even tolerate uh, if someone starts pushing their pressure up to twenty five. If they're sustained for five minutes or more, we get worried. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to intervene surgically, though. Uh, it may mean that this child might need uh, more sedation. You might have to put them in, eventually get to the point of a pentabarb coma. You've got to slow down that metabolism and everything to control pressures. And, and if you can't, then we're going to go 
pop the top. We have to do that craniectomy and give the child some more room. It doesn't necessarily happen just because they come in with a GCS of eight and they get intubated. They got a scan that doesn't warrant immediate surgical intervention. It doesn't mean that um, it, we may not need to do anything for that child, but over the course of observation in the ICU, uh, because that swelling maximizes it 48 to 72 hours after the event, you know, then, uh, and if it's not, if it can't be managed medically, then, you know, we can intervene at that point in time. But I think uh, when a child is in the ICU, uh, that's where you're probably going to have the problems with the pressures because the swelling is now occurring on down the road. And again, they're not necessarily presenting all that swelling uh, to the trauma bay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of going back into the trauma bay with a with our uh, time to CT being very um, important to to decide if they need to go to the OR or anything. And I know we talked about hypertonic saline and mannitol. Are there any medication that is necessary that we should be, such as like Keppra or any other like anti-epileptics to help with um, that that's imperative to give triage? Yeah, I, um, you, you, you nailed the, the you, you hit the nail on the head there. The, the Keppra is going to be important there load them up, uh, especially if, if you've already got word the child's got a subdural hematoma or, you know, subarachnoids with some contusions, you got to get that kid loaded up. I mean, Keppra should be, what, 60 mg per kg on a load, I think, but mm -hmm. you might find that the ED pharmacist telling us, no, you got to go with a smaller load, but uh, yeah, you get them loaded up. And and if it's a, a child that's uh, like like a just an infant, uh, you might end up with a different medication like Pentabard rather than Keppra. But the, that would be the, the first one I think you need to get started is an anti-epileptic and then worry about your 3% of the mannitol. Mm. That's interesting to know. Thank you. Um, and then I guess in the trauma, I mean, I know we're trying to do a lot within the trauma bay and like getting them to the CT um, to kind of know their disposition. Um, and I know there are lots of... Um, when you guys put in orders, especially when you guys go to the PICU, there's always like neuroprotective, neuro, neuroprotective measures. And uh -huh. what do you um, what do you mean by that? Uh, and I know we're trying to avoid secondary injury, right? We have yeah, that's the whole thing. Injury. Yeah. Okay. So what what does that mean? Like, what does that entail? Well, you know, your... when when you present with a with a trauma, initially the initial injury is the blow to the skull or the brain right or an acceleration deceleration injury and the brain mass just twisted up and you get this GAI this uh, diffuse accidental injury um, but you have secondary injury dealing with the the brain's in a, uh, ability to auto regulate itself you get hypoperfusion or hyperperfusion issues oxygenation issues um, and you need to prevent those um, and uh, a lot of times when you have hypercapnia, that's gonna create problems. If you have uh, you know, constriction, like let's say with the cerebral collar, what if it's on too tight? What if the patient's neck is falling off to the side and they're compressing their jugular vein? So now we've got poor outflow. And so we've got a venous congestion building up contributes to increased intracranial pressures and secondary injuries. Uh, are they oxygenating well enough? What's the ventilation like? Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the things you're looking out for. Uh, so you need those neuroprotective measures with uh, doing your neuro checks, making sure your EVD is functioning right. Um, and again, head position, head, head is elevated and neutral. And again, you, again, you can take that collar off. Um, and again, yeah, those are the big things you want to look out for. Um, keeping the sodium levels uh, up can help you, right? You want to uh, run them up more than 155, 160 range sometimes to be able to keep that brain swelling down um, and keep your pressures down. Awesome. And what about te temperature? Do you want to keep them cooler or warmer? Uh, you can use you can use cooling situations. Uh, mm -hmm depend upon the presentation of the patients. Uh, but we definitely don't want them being warmer. That's going to drive the metabolism up even more, I think. Um, then um, something else I'm going to touch on, but now my head's actually hurting, so I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, let's, anyways, um, I think maybe I get hit in the head over the weekend. 
No, Bobby this has did. been really great. Thank you so much, Bob. Any other questions? I mean, that we wanted to touch upon. Bob, any words of wisdom that we haven't covered so far? This has been really, really good. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think uh, certain additional things secondarily would to prevent secondary injuries, like make sure the wound is taken care of. If we've done surgery on a patient, you don't want that getting infected because that could lead to worsening problems, right? Mm -hmm. Now you've had an infection that can get inside the inside the skull. And mm -hmm. then where are we? <laughs> um, nutritional support needs to be established probably within 72 hours of a patient coming in with a traumatic brain injury, maybe they're intubated. That's, that's gonna help you prevent uh, your secondary injuries as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, it's there's there's a lot that goes into it. It's not necessarily just the primary stuff, but you were right to point uh, point out the secondary injuries that we need to prevent. You know, it's some it's really interesting when you really sit down to look at the whole trajectory of the tra uh, the traumatic brain injured child. You know, the stuff we do in the ER that's the stuff that's fast, and it's kind of you know it it's it's kind of a bit cookie cutter and a bit guideline, but it comes down to where things really get complex. I think for people to know is on the secondary injury prevention and, um, you know, all, all the aspects that go into it, like Bob said, from nutrition to decreased swelling to their labs and, you know, kind of keeping everything where it needs to be so the body can heal. Yeah. Um, and the mat, the sedation, analgesia situations. Uh, yeah. If you, got, if, you got an external, if you got an external ventricular drain in place, you know, that needs to be managed properly. And if you're forgetting to open it or, you know, after you've checked an ICP uh, and next thing you know, it's clamped and the patient's fluid isn't draining out and their pressures are going up and, oh Lord, what do we have here? So it's yeah. something simple. So yeah. preventing secondary injury, but yeah, certainly um, the, uh, the neuromonitoring and everything's involved there uh, after the fact is, is so important. Yeah. Definitely. I just thought of another subset of patients, Bob, when, what kind of injury would lend itself to um, a, a potential CSF leak and, and how, to, how would a nurse, um, uh, bedside nurse, you know, monitor for it and, and again, when, when to contact neurosurgery? Yeah, um, CSF leak. Uh, well, let's say if a patient has a, a good blow to the head and Kind of frontal here. We're involving, involving the ethmoid and sphenoid. Uh, you're probably going to get yourself a, a good chance at a CSF leak uh, coming in. You have your CSF otorrhea. Um, if it's a basilar skull fracture, you know you got your uh, battle sign going on, and you might have yourself some CSF. Uh, I mean otorrhea there, and then a rhinorrhea on the front side of things. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, the CSF leaks um, will actually heal themselves. Uh, really fast. We don't necessarily have to do surgery for that. I mean, if we've got a, a blatant open skull fracture here, you know, yeah, we're going to go in there because we have to affect, re we have to repair the dura, but something that's smaller, um, that's coming probably from a crack across the ethmoid or uh, the temporal bone, then uh, we can watch those because um, the, the body is really quick at healing that dura up. You know, mm -hmm. it, it lays in there within those cracks and crevices so that uh, that kind of English muffin kind of uh, bone surface, right? And uh, the dura can seal itself off pretty quickly. Uh, so not every CSF leak requires uh, emergent intervention. Um, we can put those kids with their head a bit up to 45 degrees, they're mentating well, and uh, we'll just watch them. And over the course of five days or so, if they're still having uh, periodic leaking with uh, you know physical exam, then we could work with a lumbar drain to take the pressure off of the upper spaces here and the body should be able to heal that up a little better. If that doesn't work, then we would work on uh, doing something surgically uh, intracranially to, to repair the leak. So, you know, we don't, just because the CS, person has a CSL, it doesn't mean that that's going to require an emergent surgery or emergent intervention. Again, the, the, the caveat to that, though, is the open skull fracture. <laughs> You've got to deal with that one. Or the dog bites, that's CSF leak too, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. we, we need to wash that out really right away and close that dura and uh, keep her from getting infected. Mm. Yeah. So for our listeners out there, I can I, I know because I could be one of them sometimes. Uh, 
Bob alluded to battle sign. I'm um, just to remind people that that's that bruise thing behind the ear. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. And, and the frontal facial fractures, you know, uh, the hard forces to the front there, you got the raccoon sign yep. uh, around the eyes. Um, yeah, things to look out for. Yeah, I, I just know that there's a lot of people you, you go back to battle sign and as soon as you tell them what it was, they're like, yes, but I just <laughs> anybody driving in their car. Um, in Google. <laughs> Liz, can you give a shout out to um the work that was done on the GCS videos. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So one of um, Bob's former colleagues, um, uh, Steph Garovich, um, uh, did a quilt project uh, a couple of years ago. And she was really interested in um, really looking at and, and refining how we, we triage um, uh, patients with traumatic brain injury who may need to go to the operating room again. As, as you've mentioned, Bob, not everyone needs to go. Uh, not everyone needs, you know, an emergent, you know, call prior to imaging uh, to your team. So again, how do we really triage these these folks? And um, you know, one question that that, uh, that that we immediately addressed was, um, how are we assessing GCS, and are we good at it? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, she took she took a look at, at videos in the trauma bay and and determined that you know it's easy. Three is easy. Fifteen's easy. Everything in between can be tough, especially in kids. Um, so we did a little investigating. We asked um, our neuro colleagues, you know, how they teach GCS. And I said, you know, gosh, we, ha we have a um, we have a, a poster, basically. And we asked people to, you know, uh, call out what they're finding in the trauma bay. And, and our neuro team said, gosh, you know, we've got a poster reference as well. And so we really took that a step further. And this, uh, what Steph presented in her in her quilt project was um, the development of two GCS videos that again give really good visuals and good um, good advice as to how we how we calculate GCS in an infant in a school age child um, in an adolescent. Um, so that was that was really step one. And then um, with this quality project, you know, kind of took things to the next level. So we've identified a patient who needs to go to the operating room. What are those priorities? and really just kind of pared it down for, again, that most critical patient, you know, getting uh, expediting CT, maintaining um, oxygenation and optimizing oxygenation, calling the hall monitor, um, getting coags and blood on hold. So um, really, I think it, those were good um, interventions um, to, again, help identify those most critical patients and then how to get them to the operating room where they need to be ultimately uh, in the safest manner. Yeah, and I just looked at uh, the trauma app, and right now those GCS videos are under resident orientation, but I will um, add them to the nursing file. Mm -hmm. And so that way all nursing all ha uh, can easily find how to do a GCS on a child video if anybody's interested. Yeah, it's it, the GCS, I mean, we, we like to use it just as a uh, way to, to identify the severity of your brain injury, but it is, uh, there are different I guess different clinicians can come up with a different uh, GCS based on their exam. And then there's confounding factors uh, with, with the patient presenting, whether it could be maybe they've got some drugs on board, maybe they're intoxicated, maybe they've got some distracting injuries and things that make it hard to really give you a solid number. So that, that's impactful too. Um, so we, we've got this standard of using GCS, but it may not always give us uh, the best read on how severe the brain injury is. You have to take everything else into consideration, the obviously the, the level of mentation uh, out in the field compared to what they were when they first rolled in the door mm -hmm. um, there. Um, and of course the imaging findings uh, may not may not justify us going to the OR kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so it's, there are a lot of factors to be considered when a child's coming in with a traumatic brain injury uh, to establish uh, a lot of factors to help you establish the severity of it. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, this has been so enlightening and so helpful to, I think for me, because I've, I've worked in the ER as well as the PICU. And this is like, kind of like put everything in a nice little package of like, kind of like start to like, to not finish, but like continuation of care through, uh, the, through our system. And Bob, thank you so much for being, um, available and, uh, willing to come on with us to talk us through um, you guys' care and what you guys look for. And we do, we do appreciate your, um, your ex expertise and your willingness to uh, be with us.
Um, uh, happy to be here. Uh, happy to participate. Uh, willing to do it again. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if I added a whole lot to you guys, but it's, it's good to work alongside you and uh, we'll continue to provide the best care for the kids out there we can. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think this was great. And we really appreciate you being on and available in the code room as often as you are. Yes. <laughs> and all <laughs> times and days and nights. <laughs> neurosurgery is here. I don't have a sticker, but neurosurgery is here. Yeah. <laughs> I actually want to get you like a, a neon cap so I can find you as you walk in. <laughs> oh yeah. There you go. Yeah. B big captain's hat there, you know, with yeah. lights flashing, <laughs> the LED lights flashing all over it. Woo -hoo -hoo. I, I, I'm open. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Present and accounted for. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, well, thanks again. Uh, thanks, yes. everybody, for watching. Thank you, guys. And we'll see you again soon. <laughs> All right.